uh, it's uh, a pleasure to uh, introduce Ernesto Lupercio from Simbestab in Mexico. He's going to talk about what says there, moduli in quantum toric geometry. Please, Ernesto, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so today, uh, what I would like to do is to describe uh, a gen a first a generalization of toric geometry that uh, just in exactly the same manner in which the quantum tori generalize the uh, ordinary tori, they deform the ordinary tori into the non-commutative realm. In the same way, uh, the quantum toric varieties were, are going to be the same, exact same kind of deformation of the toric varieties. So toric varieties are made up of tori, classical and quantum toric uh, spaces are non-commutative spaces that are made of quantum tori in exactly the same way. So uh, this is the generalization of quantum of toric geometry into quantum toric geometry. But uh, something new happens once you have these quantum toric varieties uh, and is, uh, uh oh, uh, uh, and what is uh, <laughs> what is happening uh, is that uh, if when uh, we have the quantum toric varieties, the, now you can form a modular space of them. Before, with the classical ones, you couldn't; they were torically rigid somehow. Uh, you can deform one into the other; you just couldn't do it. But now, with the quantum ones that include the classical ones and the non-commutative ones. Now you can form a modular space. And this modular space uh, has a beautiful geometry in such a way that it, it has a lot of analogies, formal analogies to the MGN modular space of classical curves. And just like the MGN admits a compactification called the delin mon for compactification of the modular space of curves. Analogously to this, and this is achieved by degenerating curves in certain ways and forming the boundary of the modular space of curves out of simpler modular spaces. And then you form the boundary and then you compactify the modular space. And this modular compactification is important in many places in mathematics and has remarkable properties. It's homology, et cetera. Uh, in the same manner, we are just starting with the new theory of modular spaces of quantum toric, non-commutative toric varieties. But uh, now this modular space also admits a compactification. And this compactification also at the boundary comes from degenerating uh, the, the toric into easier moduli toric spaces. And uh, in this talk, I will get only that far. Uh, the, the following questions and what we're working on at the moment is the reasonable questions of computing the homology of these modular spaces and things like that, and the compactifications and understanding the geometry of the modular spaces and its compactifications. Uh, so that's kind of the landscape of what I'm going to say. And then I will go uh, and do kind of a bird eye view of this story that has many, many components and details. Uh, but I'm going to turn off my camera first because my Wi-Fi tends to uh, be slower otherwise. And uh, now I'm going to write on the, on the presentation that, I, that it's here on PDF file. That I'll send to immediately after the talk. Uh, so, let me just check that I am on the right, that I can write, perfect. So uh, uh, here we have the, uh, my operators are of course, Ludmil Katsarkov, Laurent Merseman, and Alberto Berkowski and this work. And first we will review the paper called Quantum Non-Commutative Toric Geometry Foundations. Here we establish the, most of the fact that I described, but the compactification 
And compactification in particular cases is due to us, but in the more general case, the implicit case is due to a student of Laurent called uh, Anton Boava for the general compactification. Uh, so this paper contains the modular spaces, but not the compactifications. It gets as far as defining the modular spaces and the compactifications are newer. Uh, and for particular cases, we did it on a short note, sorry, finishing. <laughs> and, and the more general case Antoine has uh, dealt with. In any case, uh, classical toric geometry uh, is about classical toric varieties. So in classical toric geometry, these torus that contains the real torus is very important. This torus is the complex torus uh, in D complex dimensions, and it contains the real torus uh, in D real dimensions. And this torus is very important for us. Uh, so, so uh, the the most classical toric varieties, they say, smooth scalar project, uh, projective toric varieties, uh, come from uh, considering a polytope. So, if you have the toric variety, the toric variety is a, a particular compactification of the complex torus. There is many compactifications. For example, P1 is a compactification of the one-dimensional uh, torus, complex torus that is just C star. So P1 is this compactification. And, uh, but if you have a higher dimensional torus, well, C star cross C star, for example, can be compactified in at least two ways and in, in many more. Uh, one way to compactify it is uh, to do CP1 cross CP1, for example. But you could also compactify it to CP2. So now there are many compactifications of the higher dimension tori. And, uh, and the, the surprise of the classical theory of toric varieties is that if they were Kähler and projective and whatnot, then they would be in correspondence to polytopes. So that uh, uh, if you have one of the historic varieties, of course, it nevertheless, nevertheless contains the real torus. But the action of the real torus and the action of also of the complex torus extends holomorphically to all of X. So it acts holomorphically in all of X, not only on the torus. And this action uh, not only is holomorphic in the Kähler case, but it's also a, well, of course, symplectic action and Hamiltonian. And because it is a Hamiltonian action, uh, it has a moment map. And the image, uh, famously, the image of the moment map is a polytope together with an embedding into RD. And this polytope is, is a very special kind of polytope. Uh, it is uh, the dual of the triangulation of the D minus one sphere as a combinatorial object, but additionally, uh, it is, uh, it has more uh, conditions, you know, if you take any vertex of the polytope and you take the edges, uh, the primitive vectors at the edges, uh, the edges have all these, uh, are going in rational directions, so that P actually is better thought of as living in QD, and uh, it's going in rational directions and they form a basis at the vertex. And all these conditions, are, uh, uh, is what we call a del Sant polytope. And that's the easiest, the most concrete case of toric varieties. Uh, there are these, uh, these equivariant compactifications of the complex torus uh, that have this Hamiltonian torus action. Uh, and uh, they have this Hamiltonian torus action and the, moment, the image of the moment map on, uh, for this Hamiltonian action that is the, uh, dividing by the action of this torus gives you a, um, a nice combinatorial geometry polyto, a rational polytope that is the dual to a triangulation of the sphere. So this is the most classical story. Uh, and 
And uh, if you look at the moment map uh, uh, more carefully, and I wrote this kind of uh, uh, expository for the students that are present here, you can take a look at this, uh, not for the experts, uh, expository paper in January 2001, notes of the AMS, where I explained this uh, affair. But in any case, uh, if you look at the moment map uh, under uh, uh, more carefully, then you uh, you can uh, uh, look at the inverse image of a point, and you you will always uh, you will always uh, uh, have torus as inverse images. And the dimension of these inverse images will be in correspondence to the dimension of the facet of this combinatorial, think of this as a combinatorial complex, cell complex. And so the inverse image uh, of one point inside will be a two torus in this case, and, and the inverse image of a point like this, for example, will be this circle here. And the inverse image of a point like this will be just a point. And as you see, uh, the whole toric variety X is made up of tori or of classical tori. Real tori, the union of all these real tori is the toric variety. But also, it has a complex torus dense in the toric variety. Again, complex torus very dense. And the whole thing is made of tori. And, and and that's why they are called toric varieties. Nevertheless, a, a, a more general situation, which will be important for us. And to say very briefly, if we have this polytope, we will take this uh, race here, orthogonal to the faces, faces. And then we will consider this the composition of the whole, in this case, plane, but all, all whole RD. And this is the composition in cones uh, that give, give RD, and maybe only a piece of RD. Now, now we generalize even further and we take this cone and this, or maybe this, but not this, not this. And you will get us. Uh, uh, this this will be this is what we will call a fan, and this kind of the dual picture to the polytope. And but the thing is that fans are, as very often is the case, more general than polytopes. There is good fans that give you good toric varieties that are no longer don't, no longer come from a polytope. Some of the fans come from polytopes, uh, but some fans will not come from polytopes, and you can still do it for fans. So we will insist in doing it for fans and not for polytopes. The idea I already said it of quantum toric geometry is to replace all the tori by quantum tori. And at this, in this seminar, I don't have to say very much about what is a quantum tori. Uh, this also related to, uh, from a slightly different point of view with the formation quantization. Uh, quantum toric geometry can be thought of as a deformation uh, with a parameter. And this parameter, just to, uh, uh, to give a preview of where it is to come, the shape of things to come, it will be the parameter that forces, that forms the modular space. Uh, this will not be a very small parameter for us. This will be just the parameter that forms the modular space. The deformation parameter will be global and we'll be able to describe the whole modular space, all the holomorphic huge modular space by deforming any one of its story varieties inside. And uh, 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 so that, for example, all the projected, all the P2s in the world, for example, all the weighted P2s, but also the non commutative P2s, for, will form a modular space. So the modular space will be the modular space of P2s, so to speak. But of course, it will, it will have a, a, some coordinate some coordinate h bar uh, to the correct dimension, I don't know, see something. And uh, this coordinate modulo the action of a group will, will give you the modulo.
the space of all of P2. It will parameter. Uh, our minor space will be exceedingly nice in that they will have universal families living over them. They will have universal families. This, uh, these universal families truly classify uh, fa all possible families of P2s, with so the universal family of P2s. Uh, so, uh, I'll do, because here people are experts in non commutative geometry, but not all of them are experts in, in toric geometry. I will do an extra super fast classical review of the toric geometry, the classical one, not the quantum. Uh, and this classical toric geometry, uh, it's in many excellent, thick, fantastic books. Uh, the book by Cox and collaborators is extraordinary. Book of Fulton is very, very good, and many other books. And they tend to be very good, uh, unlike in other subjects. But uh, if you just want to learn enough to understand our theory, the students especially, uh, then uh, I recommend this paper that very quickly gets to all the basic points and also gives you computer code to actually do the, all the calculations. Uh, so you just put these lines on a computer and then you do instantaneously all the calculations. Well, not instantaneously, uh, it's when the thing is large, of course the computer suffers, but uh, it's a very good paper. In Journal of Symbolic Computation, by Elena Beryl and David Joyner. So from this paper. But this is, of course, a standard. I, I'm just taking it from this paper. So uh, an affine toric variety. Uh, so now I have a fan. So a fan looks something like this. But I'm going to consider just one cone. And of course, uh, it's very important from now on to consider the integer lattice in R A R D. So I'm going to consider the integer lattice in Rd, the interior lattice. And I'm going to consider this cone, but the cone will be thought of as the, the set of these integer points. It will be thought of as an integer cone or the integers. So, well, say you have a rational cone and here rational is extremely important. Say you have a rational cone, then you can produce a commutative semi-group uh, by taking the dual of the cone and then taking the dual lattice. This is the dual lattice, uh, what you would expect it to be. So you get a, uh, and uh, uh, because it's a cone, the dual cone is a cone. Uh, if you add two things to of these integral points, you still get to one of these integral points. So it is a semi-group. It, it doesn't have additive inverses, but it has, an addition and it's associative and all that, and over the integers. Uh, and just like that you form usually the group algebra of a group, you can also form, no problem, the semi-group algebra, F is a field. But for us, F will more, more, uh, will is simply the complete numbers. Uh, we can also do this theory that we do in this paper for the real numbers, uh, but uh, we haven't worked out all the details. And for other fields, we think a lot of it can be done, but we haven't done it. So, uh, uh, but in this paper, we consider only the field of the complex numbers. And so you form this semi-group algebra and you can form it spec. And this is the, the toric, the affine toric variety associated to the cone. And to each one of the cones in your fan, you do this. And then this, because the intersection of cones are also cones in a fan, you can glue them and get a global object that is the toric variety associated to the fan. In any case, this is the semi-group, and then the semi-group algebra, and then the spec. And now everything is defined. And we can go from a rational, rational cone to one of these uh, affine toric uh, varieties, algebraic. But of course, if the cone was not rational, you could not do this. And that's the whole point of our theory. Uh, just like the quantum torus uh, has this dichotomy between the rational and the irrational, the rational is this classical theory, and the irrational is the quantum toric geometries where you will get quantum tori living inside. Here, I should say that 
If you just take the code made by the object and nothing else, and you do this process, then uh, what, what you get is a torus. And uh, it's an interesting exercise in empty sets, but anyway, you get a torus and uh, you get a dense torus. This contains a dense torus. This contains, it's not anymore a compactification, it's just a partial compactification of these dense torus. Uh, it's just a partial compactification. Well, here we have a little example. We have a specific uh, cone picture there. You can see it there. And then you get the dual cone. And now you can see it there. This is the original cone. This is the dual cone. And there you can see it there. And now you do it this very, very carefully. Well, you get the generators of the cone, and this is the, the part that would fail if the cone would be irrational. And because these are the generators of the cone, now you, you can find that these monomials generate the, the group algebra, the semi-group algebra. And, uh, and well, here you can by hand check that this is the same as this. Oh, well, then you get the, the, that what you get is this variety as an affine toric variety. So this variety, if you give me this cone, what you obtain is this variety as an affine toric variety. Uh, and this, of course, has a torus action if you think about it. Uh, um, so it's a, it has a de tor dense torus inside uh, if you use the complex numbers. Pans uh, are a bunch of cones, and they satisfy these things that if uh, if it's, uh, you, you, one of the cones is in the fan and you have a face of the cone, then the face is on the fan, and if two of the cones are on the fan, and the intersection is a face of both, uh, then the intersection is a face of both of them, and then belongs to the fan. So this is the definition of a fan, and in dimension two, it looks something like this. And then it's hard to draw in other dimensions. Uh, even in dimension two, it can be very uh, challenging to imagine some fans. Uh, but this is what a fan is. And uh, fans com could come from polytopes, and they could also not come from polytopes. If they come from polytopes, you take these orthogonal directions, and, this and there is a this duality where the polytope uh, gives you this fan, but notice that the following polytope gives you the exact same fan. And also this polytope gives you the exa exact same fan. And uh, once we form the toric variety associated to the fan, associated to the polytope, uh, well, if I just forget the polytope because many polytopes give the same fan, then the set of shapes of all these polytopes that are allowed, that give you the same fan is the so-called Kähler cone of X. So you can put one symplectic for every shape of a, of a polytope, you can put a symplectic form, uh, and this is, will be the Kähler cone of the toric variety, the, the set of all these shapes of polytopes. In any case, well, here is another example, uh, uh, but probably I won't uh, elaborate this because I'm started to run late. Uh, this one is a much more important for us, and this one I have to consider. Take the fan that has these three cones, take the cones, take the specs, and if you go through the definition, you get exactly P2. So the fan of P2 looks like this. That's very important for us. The fan of P2 looks like that. And uh, well, uh, this is on the paper, but also on the presentation, uh, you will see these details. Uh, so you have this, this fan gives you exactly P2 and gives you P2 together with a chart decomposition with three charts, one for every one of these cones. Every one of these cones gives you one chart. And in this case, the charts are commutative. They are just, uh, every one of these charts look like C2. And I am gluing these three C2s to obtain P2. In the classical toric geometry situation. So I'm just gluing these three C2s to obtain P2. 
but uh, uh, and in general, uh, the same kind of picture go goes in general. If I have a fan, it could be a complete fan that covers all of R D or not. Then I fo form the, the various affine toric varieties, uh, one for every cone. And then I use the combinatorial information of the fan to glue them into the whole toric variety. And the whole toric variety is associated to the fan. And there is these instructions specifically tell you how to glue the whole toric variety with as many charts as maximal cones has a fan. This is what you must remember that you have as many charts as maximal cones has the fan. Now, the basic block of known uh, of quantum toric geometry is the quantum torus, of course. And here I'm very lucky not to have to elaborate enormously about the quantum torus. So uh, you know the quantum, the real quantum to torus. Uh, but stop me if, if you want me to say anything. Uh, and uh, and you have the real quantum to torus, and you know this arithmetic dichotomy for the parameter h bar for the quantum to torus. That is that the space is truly non-commutative only when h bar is irrational. When h bar is rational, its algebra functions is more equivalent to a commutative algebra. So uh, true non-commutativity is related to rationality condition on the parameter. Uh, sorry, may I ask a question? Um... Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So in the case of uh, your non-commutative toric varieties, did you say if the lattice is rational, you get a commutative uh, standard toric variety? Correct, correct. Also, oh, it's not Morita equivalent, it's really a toric variety. Well, the presentation that I will, of, I, can, I have to, all this, this is homotopy theory. The presentation I will obtain will, won't look on the nose commutative, but it will be more equivalent to the classical. Oh, it's more equivalent also in, in, in the Toric case also is only more equivalent. That's right. It I see. Only be Very more Thank uh, you. What I, what I will obtain, it will be this Himongos algebra, gluing of all these algebras, one for every cone. And, uh, but it won't be, it, uh, when I look at it naively, I will, it will look at that non-commutative algebra. But there will be the secret uh, homotopy. This will be more equivalent to a commutative algebra of the toric, classical toric varieties. In any case, you know that the Kronecker foliation is very important for the quantum torus, and we can get the holonomy group, groupoid of the Kronecker foliation. But just to set the notation, uh, I will call the exponential map E, capital E, and it will be this exponential map, capital E. E will go from R2 into C2, and this, this is important for me, this, this, this exponential map, this notation. Now, you know the chronic foliation here, I don't have to explain the holonomy and how from the holonomy you get the non-commutative algebra, uh, but my geometric model for the quantum torus will be the chronic foliation. My geometric model for the quantum torus will be chronic foliation, and of course, you know as well that you have the two torus with the, with the flow, the Kronecker flow. And this is uh, equivalent to the transversal circle. With the, uh, with the rotation by the angle rotation by angle H bar. And uh, these two groupoids are the same, are equivalent, and uh, they give you the quantum torus. So, uh, and I will have several avatars for the quantum torus. Uh, so, to be able to talk about Kähler structures and all these, I will not remember the whole groupoid, but I will only remember the Morita equivalence class of the groupoid which is standard, the stack actually, I will remember the stack in a little bit more delicate fashion. I will remember the stack as a stack of groupoids over the side of toric maps, but you can ignore that during this talk. Imagine that 
I don't uh, I don't think of this as, as a sheaf of groupoids on a side. Imagine that I just think of it as a monolithic equivalence class of the groupoids of the Kronecker flow on the torus, uh, or the irrational rotation on the circle, which you are extremely familiar with. So, in any case, I have four avatars for the quantum torus. As a groupoid, I have the Kronecker flow on the torus. Uh, and this as a groupoid is the circle modulo the rotation by h bar. Uh, I also have the non commutative algebra. I have the non commutative space, whatever it is. There is several possible definitions. I, I'm thinking of non commutative algebra as modulo moita equivalence as non commutative spaces, opposite. And a uh, and I have the stack that is the Morita equivalence class of the groupoids. The stack is Morita equivalence classes of groupoids, and non commutative spaces are Morita equivalence classes of non commutative algebras. And C is convolution. So I have these four avatars for the quantum torus. And I'm going to very much use this, uh, this one. But even this one is what, what you could think of a lot of the time. So these four avatars of the, for the quantum torus is what I just said. We have the translation, the groupoid, the non commutative algebra, the non commutative space, and the non separated, non algebraic smooth stack. And this I can promote, all this I can promote to be over C. I, it doesn't need to be over R. And I need it over C as well. I need over R, but I need as well over C. You're like in the classical quantum, in the classical toric geometry. So, uh, so just me, but you may not like this, uh, I will call the quantum torus the stack, namely the Morita equivalence class of the group point. And then we'll call the NC torus the algebra uh, or the Morita equivalence class of the algebra. Here, if you ignore that, you think of this of the groupoid and this of the algebra. So I will call the quantum torus the groupoid and the non commutative torus the algebra, just to have a language. And we have the exponential isomorphism that I have already mentioned, the transversal to the foliation. Uh, as a stack, I can think of it in terms of the whole torus or of the transversal circle. And if I think of it of the transversal circle, also the other time, but let me just do this. Here I have the circle. Here I have the universal cover. And if an R I act by the shift one, the deck transformation one, and by H bar, is the same thing as if I ask, I just take the rotation on S1. And I will use this one, that is the logarithmic representation of this one. So, uh, so the quantum torus can also be thought of as R modulo one H bar. This is also common practice and it's very important for me. So, uh, because I want to think of this quantum toro in terms of lattices, just like you used to think of tora in terms of lattices. I want to think of quantum tora in terms of quantum lattices. So uh, a quantum lattice or quasi lattice uh, uh, behaves quite differently if H is rational or not. Uh, when H is rational, gamma is really a lattice in R. And when H is irrational, is is a quantum lattice. And so uh, uh, this is like the logarithm of the rotation group. And, uh, and uh, this will be an important, very important representation of the quantum torus for us. R modulo the quantum lattice. Because I want to move, no, this is already, as I move H bar, I move the lattice. And then I move the tori. Uh, and then, well, I don't really want to do, do two. 
I want to do d plus one, but uh, because quantum p1, quantum p1 will be a compactification of t c1 gamma, of t c1 gamma, not of t c2 gamma, I, I shift the notation by one and call this is t c2 gamma. But tc2 gamma lives inside p1. And because I don't want the two inside the one, I shift the notation by one. So uh, this is the quantum torus. Is, uh, and this will be an important representation of the quantum torus for us in terms of quantum lattices. These quantum lattices already connect the lattices of toric geometry with the lattices of quantum Torah. So quantum P1, I, I just said it, wants to be a compactification of TC one H bar, that is TC H bar two. It wants to be a compactification. So how do I achieve this compactification? Well, for quantum P1, uh, uh, I, I, didn't, I have this automorphism of the quantum torus. Of quantum torus. I have this automorphism of the quantum torus. So, uh, but I, the C star, I close to C. So uh, I get this chart. This, this is inside C modulo X two pi I gamma. This is inside C modulo X two pi I gamma. This partially compactifies this hemisphere. This other one partially compactifies this hemisphere and I glue by the automorphism in the intersection. And so this is the way in which I get the two charts and these two non-commutative charts. And I glue these two non-commutative charts and I get quantum P1. Let me stop two seconds and ask for questions. Okay. I, 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 wait, wait, wait. Is there, can you show us an algebra? I mean, so, uh, you define something by gluing things together, which normally in, in an algebra geometry situation, that means you have a, a sheaf, right? Uh, which mm -hmm. may or may not have any global sections. But in the mm -hmm. in the C star uh, setting, you always have uh, global sections. Uh, That's right. Is there, is there an algebra? So there should be one algebra here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a, a, I will construct one, one, on, one foliation only so that this algebra will be the holonomy algebra of this foliation. Mm -hmm. So right now I do it with charts, but I can do the geometric invariant theory to construct only one foliation that extends the chronicle foliation and the holonomy groupoid of this one foliation, the convolution algebra of this groupoid is the one algebra that you're looking for. Yeah, I believe this algebra would be like the algebra representing the affine part of your non-commutative um, um, toric variety, right? Not exactly. Look at what I'm going to do. Look at what I'm oh. going to do. Maybe you're right, but I think it's okay. slightly different. Slightly okay. different. Yeah. Uh, well, dimension counting already mentioned the dimension counting. Yes, it's the important comment. Uh, this P1, this CP1, H bar, uh, leaves as the, as the holonomy, uh, as the, uh, there is one foliation in one complex, one holomorph foliation in one complex manifold. So that this is the quotient of that action uh, of C, this. And now you can see that there is just one algebra, Guillermo. Uh, uh. 
Yeah, okay. So there is just one algebra because I have this C acting on H NH bar. This non-compact group mm -hmm. acting on this compact complex manifold, compact complex manifold acted on by a non-compact group, but holomorphically. NH bar is complex, but not scalar, not symplectic. So it's not algebraic in H bar. And the action is not algebraic, but it's holomorphic. So we have this action of C on NH bar. And uh, NH bar, I can tell you topologically what it is, is S3 crosses one. It's a Hopf. S3 crosses one. And then I have on S3 crosses one, if I ignore the holomorphic, an action of the non compact group C the abelian non-compact group C. And TP1 is just a quotient. So there is, of course, one algebra. Do you like it, Guillermo? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, this action of C depends on H bar. This action on C so, so, depends on H bar. So, if I restrict, if I restrict to uh, here inside, the torus, uh, uh, then actually this is ex exactly the Kronecker foliation restricting to a part of this. So this extends the Kronecker foliation into a compact manifold here. Mm -hmm. Because the Kronecker foliation lives on a non-compact manifold C star cross C star. It lives on a non-compact manifold C star cross C star. Uh, uh, that, uh, that, li uh, that lives inside R4, or C star cross C star cross C star, lives on a non-compact manifold, the Kronecker foliation, and this extends this Kronecker foliation into a compact manifold holomorphically. And so there's only one algebra. Uh, and, uh, this is a Hopf surface. It's not, it's not an LBM manifold. Well, it is an LBM manifold, but what do I mean by LBM manifold? One can generalize the situation more and more. For example, from P1, one can go on to Pn, Pn minus one, Pn minus one, like this, instead of S3 crosses one for P1, we get this product of even, uh, odd spheres for the product of uh, projective spaces. And here one can also obtain these foliations that extend the chronicle foliations into a compact manifold. Uh, and, uh, and, but in this case, it's called Calabi Ekman manifolds. The holomorphic structure here is the Calabi Ekman structure. And the foliation is holomorphic by the theorem of Hefliger. But, uh, but uh, can it be done for any toric variety? Unfortunately, in 2004, Laurent, Merseman, and Alberto Verhovsky proved that you could find an N that does this for any toric variety. Uh, you could find these. And for homotopy theorists, uh, I can say that this is the twofold homotopy cover. Or for classical topologies, I can say that this is equivalent to something called a moment angle complex. But for geometers, I can just say that it's an LBM manifold. Again, it's a complex manifold, but not symplectic in general. A complex manifold, but not simple. And the foliation will give you the classical toric variety. And of course, as you deform this holomorphic from this foliation, you obtain the quantum toric varieties. This is the basic idea. Uh, and this is more or less what I was saying. Uh, notice that uh, this uh, uh, here I'm dividing by an elliptic curve by S1 crosses one. But uh, this is one crosses one has a universal cover and R2, that is actually a C. And this is the C that I was talking about. But if I map this stack into this stack, this is a GERF. And so my P1 remembers a GERF over P1. And this size, like the, even the classical, to, to, to go back to the question earlier on in this talk, 
even the classical toric varieties, I decide the twofold homotopy cover of the classical toric variety remembers a degree of freedom. It remembers for free a degree of freedom. And I can turn it on or not, as physicists would say. And I decide to turn on the V field. So I, the, even the classical toric varieties come with a, it's ca, their, their canonical year. Their canonical year. So they, even the classical ones, in the presentation I am choosing, look non-commutative. I added a, little, a canonical little non-commutative degree of freedom so that I can form the whole modular space nicely. Uh, so well, uh, the quantum fan for P1 look, looks like this. This is a unit vector. But then this, this is one. But then this could be of a different length. And this length would be, well, would be more or less in correspondence with h bar. And of course, now I can form many quantum p1s. Let me just call it h bar here. Uh, and of course, I have the quantum lattice that looks of the odd rank, and looked of the wrong rank because it ranked two over, over q, but lives inside r1. Seems to have the, the wrong rank, but it's okay. So now what is a quantum fan? Now you guessed. A general quantum toric stack that will have one algebra. It will have the convolution algebra of a foliation on a holomorphic foliation on a complex non-symplectic manifold. Can be constructed starting from a general, not necessarily rational, not necessarily rational, quantum fan. And uh, how much time do I have left, Guillermo? Sorry. I am 10 minutes, perhaps. I may make it nine. I, I, sorry, I, I was muted. I hadn't realized. OK, I'll make it nine. I'll make it nine. Anyway. A quantum fan, it looks very much like a fan. A fan used to live on a lattice. The rays used to live on the lattice. But now the quantum fan lives on a quantum lattice. And it's the same definition like classical toric varieties, but now we have quantum fans. And there is a way to, from one quantum fan follow with this gluing procedure, like the one I more or less described so far, and to get the quantum toric stack. Actually, uh, it's much nicer to first remember the calibration and then if you want to forget it, forget it. But I will remember the calibration. So the calibration is, I will get generators for gamma. The image of H is the quantum lattice. But I will remember not gamma, but H. I will remember H, not gamma, and H will be my deformation parameter. So the modular space will be made of H's. Uh, and so uh, we have the, uh, we can form now the modular space. Uh, uh, I will yeah, now skip everything. And uh, in the, you will have in the transparencies that will be there on the website, the example, for example, of P2s. Here's the example of P2s, and you can do it. And now it's funny that the, the way the algebra looks like, you end up with irrational exponents, but they make sense. But they make sense. Uh, and so you can glue this quantum toric varieties. And uh, you can have quantum geometry and theory. We do it. We get quantum, the, the same stable points, all that story. So we do the quantum invariant theory. And with the quantum invariant theory, we kind of answer, although I want to open the question to this crowd, we give everything to compute explicitly the algebras with generators and everything. But we haven't really computed the algebra with generators and everything. This is a project that I have a student that is trying to compute some cases of these algebras and understand these algebras in terms of the more classical system algebra uh, picture. Uh, 
Uh, but because the stack is now represented by an action, uh, by a groupoid uh, of a non-compact group acting, uh, well, on these uh, semi-stable points in the geometric invariant theory, then it, you should be able to do it. And, uh, uh, and of course, in nicer cases, it gets nicer and it gets nicer and nicer this representation. You put more and more hypo. Uh, it's the one that comes from a polytope. Not all the fans come from a polytope, but if you come from a polytope, you get everything scalar. And it's very nice. We use a theorem of Ishida for this. In any case, uh, we get, now you can get, remember the H bar, it goes from the classical lattice of higher dimension to the quantum lattice in lower dimension, H is the deformation parameter. And now you can form the deformation parameter with these H's, modulo equivalences, of course, group, acting on the H's. And it's very nice. But now there is many flavors to this module. Uh, if you put more GERF, less GERF, etc., many flavors. With the right kind of flavor, you can obtain, for example, of all all weighted projected spaces are the rational points of the module space. And the non-commutative, uh, the quantum projected spaces are the rest, the irrational points of the module space. And then you form the whole module space and you get the orbifold points in the module space that are the ones where the fans are, or the polytopes are especially symmetric. Symmetric polytopes. Then you get these points there are orbital points in the modular space because they have too many symmetries. Uh, and so you get the modular space. It's a nice orbital. If you put the nice conditions in certain conditions, you have a tight Miller theory for this modular space. You can get a, this tight Miller space and, and the modular space is the quotient of the tight Miller space. And you can get applications, et cetera. But if you choose the simplest possible modular space of this quantum torx, uh, where you have the minimum amount of jerk and everything is the simplest possible situation, then the modular space looks like an open set omega contained in Rd minus D and acting on by a, acted on by a group. And this group is a finite group. And this is what the modular space looks like in its more canonical uh, setting. It's just an open set of our, this tight Mueller thing, modulo, a finite group, a nice finite group. Just like the, you could get the complex, uh, the, the Lindman for compactification. This is what you degenerate curves and you get the, the Lindman for compactification. This modular space, D is the genus. D is the com it's just the combinatorics of the fan. It's just the post deposit, the combinatorial invariant of the of the toric variety, and I will call it today the genus of the toric variety. And so I have M, D, uh, and really this uh, uh, this uh, has this number. And if I fix D, for example, let me fix D. I get MDN, where N is the amount of GERF and is the analogous of the mark points in the classical situation. Is the analogous of the mark points in the classical situation. Get a, a parallel situation, MDN. Could I compactify MDN? And well, for practice spaces in this note that Guillermo will probably kill me about, uh, we do, we compactify universal family for the projected spaces. And it's a very nice, uh, MD turns out to be simply a simplex modular symmetric group. But, it, but we construct the universal family over the modular space of quantum PDs, quantum PDs. This is quantum PDs, includes the classical ones with slightly with the GERF that it's turning on a little bit of non-commutativity, but it's canonical. And uh, the compactification, it's very nice. 
we obtain the compactization by degenerating the fan in various directions and getting the various modular spaces. And so we get the compactification. And yes, we could do it for predictive space. So Antoine saw that we could do it for predictive space. It's very nice compactification. It has a universal family on top of these uh, orbifolds. This is an orbifold. And so the, the, quant, the modular space of quantum PDs is an orbifold. Well, this one, the compactification. And the boundary is made of the simpler modular spaces in a nice combinatoric fashion. And it that looks, the combinatorics looks surprisingly similar to the, the Lean Mount for compactification, it's different, but it comes through the generations. And Antoine proved that uh, in, if you started with a simplicial fan, you can do the same. You can generalize our procedure and you could take the modular space embed it on a Grassmannian, take the closure, and the compactification, the boundary is made of the modular spaces in lower dimensions for parts, for the generations of this fan, taking off different cones and this kind of thing. And so the compactification exists. And an interesting question is, Q, what is the cohomology of the compactification for, for a given fan, for a given combinatorial type? And uh, that's all I will say for today. Okay. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, so two questions maybe. Um, so these moduli spaces you construct, uh, I mean, are they like fine moduli spaces or coarse moduli? I mean, Fine, fine modular space. They're fine because you have the universal family, yes. Uh, I have the universal family. Right, so is there any analog of mapping class group in this picture? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, here it is, here it is, it's this group here that I call G in the paper that I haven't sent. Oh, I see, so I see. Okay, right, okay, uh-huh. So this is the analog of mapping class group. This is it is related to mapping compute, class group? Computing the group cohomology, computing the group, it is related to the tropical mapping class group. Ah, I see, I see. I see. It is a tropical mapping class group. Uh, it's isomorphic, you're saying, it's isomorphic. Mapping. Well, if you get the tropical curves inside, you get the mapping class group mapping into this group and that kind of thing. I see, I see. Uh, but let me just say that uh, G, uh, group, computing the group cohomology of G is interesting and non-trivial and possible for G, a given D, even mm. computable in a computer for a given D. Now mm. there is no hope for a general D because a D is anything in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. Further questions? Thank you. Uh, I have a very stupid, silly question showing how little I understood of your talk. Um, <clears throat> namely, so say you have a semi-group coming from a cone, uh -huh. right? Uh, now, uh, so I take you know, the semi-group algebra and that, that is my understanding of what an affine uh, toric variety is. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, I mean, I you uh, imagined that an affine quantum toric variety would be some deformation of such a semi-group algebra? Absolutely. Is, is there such a thing? I mean, uh, as in, in, the, in the case of uh, the, the usual uh, non commutative tora is, you know, you understand it, it gives you some, some parameter which deforms the usual uh, multiplication in the tore. So, is there a recipe like that for, say, a quantum affine tora, torus? Uh, or toric variety? Yes, but, yes, but, yes. 
but I have only written in the simplest of cases. Uh, it's, I think it's algorithmic to compute this thing uh, that you're asking for, but I have not really worried too much so far for the explicit computer. I know that it exists, it's there. It's a von Neumann algebra to be sure, uh, but, uh, but very little is known today about, uh, I mean, you could write, if I give you a cone and a quantum lattice and a way to deform a lattice into a quantum lattice, and I can do that, I can write that explicitly, uh, you could sit down and write down these algebras, but it would be much nicer to have a theory of these algebras, uh, what characterizes them, something, you know, something not mm. just, uh, not just these, like the difference of, the, of saying that uh, a sister algebra is a star close of algebra of operators in human space mm -hmm. and saying that, you know, define it by actions. That's what you mean. Yeah, 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 exactly. It would be nice to have a very specific, because these are, uh, these are the correct time of, uh, type of algebras to develop. Uh, this is one step in a longer story. Uh, of course, our next, uh, there are many directions, of course. Uh, the whole theory of geometry has to be developed in, for this, and we have developed part of it, and now new new ingredients appear. There were no modular spaces in the classical theory. Antoine has managed to extend the universal family to the so-called secondary polytope. So now he can do astonishingly Atilla flops, literally, in the past, it was kind of a combinatorial thing. You do an Atilla flop from one to the other. But now you can write the whole family of quantum torus between one extreme of the Atilla flop and the other. Now you can write the, the, all the quantum torus, the universal family that uh, you can see the movie, the whole movie of an Atilla flop, which was impossible until very recently. Uh, so he extended the universal family to the secondary polytope, for example. Uh, but uh, for example, the case of polytopes, just ordinary, not even secondary polytopes, just the polytopes. Uh, I have not even tried to write the spectral triple and it must be there. It's a non commuted space with a metric. Uh, so uh, what is the spectral triple? What it looks like? Uh, it is a whole, a whole entire project to translate this to the most, to the more uh, familiar language of non-commutative geometry. Uh, for ab because of abstract theory, we know it exists, is there, and it's interesting. Uh, but what does it really look like explicitly? What the properties? How does it connect to what people know? Uh, this is wide open. Uh, really, is totally wide open for the non-commutative geometers to run with it. Okay. The other direction that we're working on, of course, is of course the modular spaces already seem to have something like topological recursion. Uh, although it won't be as rich as topological recursion, probably, as Maxim has pointed out, Maxim Konsevich has pointed out, still I, I believe that there will be some shadow of topological recursion. And uh, this uh, I would be very interested to see what the PDEs involved in the cohomology of these spaces are. So that's one ambitious direction. Another interesting direction though, is to develop the non-commutative tropical geometry. As we know, toric geometry is the easiest instance of tropical geometry. And of course, now we know how to define tropical curves and intersection numbers and this kind of thing, non-commutative tropical curves. But of course, it would be extremely interesting to have the degeneration theory from non-commutative geometry to, to non-commutative tropical geometry. This would be, this would give new facts about sister algebras that, that would be ruled by sophisticated combinatorics that would be extremely hard to see from the point of view of sister algebra because they are ruled by these secret combinatorics that leaves behind. Just like tropical geometry gave new truths about complex geometry that were hard to see in the complex geometry setting, 
but because they were ruled truly by this combinatorial geometry, tropical geometry. So these are some of the directions. But of course, non commutative geometries, talk to me, please. There, there is millions of questions and lack of expertise on my, on my part to, to, to make the whole bridge, really, the, of this whole edifice, uh, of these non commutative hyperic uh, spaces. Okay, so are there any further questions? Maybe just one more last question, sorry. I mean, did I understand correctly you said that quantum projective spaces are special cases of these quantum toric varieties? That's right, that's right. Okay, because yeah. that theory is very well, more or less well developed. Uh, I mean, we know the C-star algebra, we know we have a spectral triples on them, you know, classification of- That's right. Okay. Lime models and stuff like that, yeah. We should do, we should bridge this story. We yeah, so that's a good point to start, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'll email you to ask you questions. You know. Yeah. And Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So, if there are no further questions, we finish here. Thank you. Yeah.